Hey guys, what's up? It is week 196, and uh, yeah, I have some reviews for you, but first and foremost, I want to let you know there's there's a little bit of review. There's only like seven reviews, and that's because I had to watch the Twilight movies for the 22 Shots of Moods and Horror. Yes, the Twilight series goes completely against everything I wanted to do, because I typically don't like talking about things that I know I won't like, that aren't for me. I don't like to be negative, and you know, when something's not made for me, it's just like, what's the point of me talking about it? It's obviously my opinion means nothing, but we did them anyways. Patreon, Yeah. So, if you're interested in seeing Old Man Parker talk about the Twilight movies, check it out. I'll give some shout-outs to some podcasts that have some YouTube channels that aren't getting uh, the attention I think that maybe they should deserve. I don't know. Maybe you should get. The Exploding Heads has a YouTube channel, and they're putting some of their Patreon exclusives on there now. So, if you missed the Exploding Heads, check out them on YouTube, and you can hear some of their uh, new episodes. Um, they're far behind, but you haven't heard them if you're not a Patreon. So, yeah, ch- a patron. So, check it out. Also, the podcast Under the Stairs has a YouTube channel, so check that out. The great podcast. Very cool. Um, his and hers, um, movie podcast has a YouTube channel. You should check them out. That's JP and Carly doing their thing. JP's my co-host on 22 shots and Carly pops up there every once in a while. And, uh, last definitely check out the podcast. Um, that is from a YouTuber, uh, Tom Horsball, uh, has a podcast called cannibal Holocaust and you can check it out on Spotify. I listened to the first three episodes. They're all spectacular, especially the first episode about cannibal Holocaust. Well produced, well scripted, uh, very good stuff, and I agree with pretty much everything he said. I can't think of anything I disagree with. Very uh, well informed and in depth. Loved it. So let's hop into the reviews. And the first one is going to be Blood Ceremony by Jorge Grau. You guys know Jorge Grau. Uh, he did Let Sleeping Corpses Lie, which is probably one of the f- definitely one of the finest zombie films ever made from 1974. One of my personal favorites. He made this one a year before 1973. This is also known as Legend of Blood Castle, which had a DVD release from Severn Films, which I actually never had a chance to watch. So when I popped this in, I was very excited to see that it looked freaking gorgeous. They remastered it. It looked amazing. Sounded great. Um, there's three versions of the film on here. The um, you can Basically two. You can watch the original Spanish version, and you can watch the international version in English or Spanish. So uh, that's very cool. So um, this is a very uh, period piece horror film, very much in the vein of a superstitious kind of townsfolk kind of movie, which I love, you know, think Hammer and stuff. Um, And this also kind of mixes uh, the folklore of Count Dracula or vampires from that time and... um, Elizabeth Batori or Bathory, Elizabeth Batori or Batori or whatever they say. I, I've heard it pronounced both ways. So it's kind of a mixture of those stories, which I absolutely loved. If you guys aren't familiar with uh, that person, she basically bathed in virgin's blood and it's supposedly a true story. So I like the idea that they're mixing a fictional character in Count Dracula and a historically <laughs> character, kind of fictionalizing it, of course. Um, it's an ancestor of that character. So, uh, and Elizabeth Batori. So we have these two different mixtures and stuff like that. Um, we also covered a while back Countess Dracula which is also Elizabeth Pettori's story Um, I'm interested in the story I like the story and uh, it's very interesting, like I said. So and it's uh, it's cool that these two are mixed. And I would relate it kind of like how Hammer would mix the Birkin Hare and Frankenstein's monster stories a little bit together and stuff. I love that. So, okay, Blood Ceremony. This is kind of a crazy movie, of course. Uh, and it basically follows this small t- this small village that's superstitious. There's some murders that happen. There's a murder, and they blame this old man who has recently died. They actually dig him up and stake him and hold him responsible for being a vampire. Um, they have this big trial where somebody there named Van Helsing is there, which I loved. And uh, yeah, the Marquise is there. And he's interested in everything. And there's a lot of people that doubt it, doubt the existence of that and everything. And there's a medallion to blame that this guy wore. The supposedly medallion is what caused him to be evil and come back to life and die and everything in the first place. So the Marquise doesn't believe it. He takes the medallion um, and he decides to wear it. His wife is this kind of aging woman who is starting to have, you know, uh, that uncomfortability of aging and stuff, which is something that I've always been kind of sensitive to in films. I've always liked that. Nobody wants to get old, see wrinkles and everything and she's starting to doubt that her husband has feelings for her so at one day she realizes that um, when she slaps a servant not a very nice woman obviously and gets her blood on her hand it kind of clears up her skin a little bit and that gives her the idea and her helper brings up the idea that you were in you know you're an ancestor of Elizabeth Pittori or somebody or somebody in vain or something like that did this and she says you know the story she's like yes I do so she gets interested in you know bathing in the blood of uh, virgins but she doesn't necessarily want to go through it too much because she has a conscience 
which is surprising, right? Um, so anyways, the Marquise actually dies from wearing the medallion, and uh, pretty soon he rises, or we think he rises from the grave, is, is basically what's happening. We don't know what's going on, but a lot of people are murdered and everything, and uh, and all that. So it's like, okay, so we have these two different things going on. We have this vampire legend, and we have the the Elizabeth Vittori bathing in the blood of these, these people who are ending up getting killed. And there's this really iconic moment where we have the actual blood dripping on her, and she's standing there like this, and it just looks great great just amazing but anyways this has a couple twists and it calls back to the real story of elizabeth Vittori, how it ended and everything like that just a really excellent movie really um enjoyed it um and i know there's some special features on here that i want to mention there is a um uh, interviews with Jorge Grau and there is I believe yes there's a commentary Troy Haworth and Nathaniel Thompson which is also great because Troy Haworth is one of the best of the that does these kind of things always enjoy his work so anyways this one looks spectacular uh, has three versions of the movie on there it's got some really cool um, imagery and everything like that unfortunately there's some real life animal abuse in here and I noticed that's kind of where the movie kind of gets some hits on its uh, it's, it's letterbox rating people are like oh, I never watched this but I know that's just a very much a product of its time from the 70s and 80s and Euro horror and all that kind of stuff so unfortunately there's some birds that get ripped apart by the uh, Marquise's hawks um, and it's shown in gruesome detail and a bat is 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 burned which these are unpleasant things no doubt but um i don't want to sound like insensitive but if you're used to watching euro horror films you're probably used to this kind of stuff um I, i'm not gonna um knock dock points off for it because you know um the only time i've, I've ever done that is in that um, uh, the vinegar syndrome release of that Senna Sinistra movie where they just killed a toad for no reason because the special effects in that movie were so ungodly poor anyways they literally didn't even have to do that because it's like you're you usually used a baby doll to show how little you cared about your effects yet you're gonna kill it get the fuck out of here for them uh, that movie was lazy um, this one pretty damn good so check it out blood ceremony okay the next one is also a mondo macabre release and it is directed by paul nashi himself starring paul nashi himself from 1982 panic beats um and this is an upgrade from their dvd which i actually never got a chance to check out so uh this is a super gothic story here paul nashi is uh the opening of this movie let me say this first it opens up in beautiful atmosphere um amazing atmosphere we have this uh these shrouded woods that are all covered in fog and everything i guess the the woods are shrouded with fog and we have this woman running through completely naked and i was like what is going on we have this this uh, knight chasing her on horseback with a flail with a mace on it and uh just tracks her down and kills her and then we're kind of transported to modern times and paul nashi is married to this rich woman who has cancer and he's ordered or a heart problem she has a heart problem and he's ordered right there you see very gothic right uh, ordered to take her to his old country home where his ancestor he lived um the knight and uh have her calm down and everything like that living there is an old servant of his that uh has a relationship and her niece her niece is kind of shady very shady actually and uh pretty soon uh they all start to tell the story of the night and it's giving this woman some heart problems you guys know where it's going i said it's very gothic i don't want to spoil anything but about halfway through it kind of takes a turn and changes everything but then about again it takes another turn with double crossing and different things like that and actually gets to that you know brings that legend back up um there's a couple really gratuitous deaths in here a gory deaths and they, they're fantastic looking but the death that really bothered me most was a strangulation just because it got so dark and so bleak and how it was done and who carried it out and who it was to which is really nasty stuff kind of uh really kind of dark but uh i thought it was effective as hell this is a pretty good movie the opening i loved it to the middle it started to lose me just for a second but brought me back um and the ending i thought you know like the ending brought me back so i thought this was really good um it, it starts off really kind of like uh supernatural but becomes this great gothic kind of horror story that's very typical but hey all gothic stories are kind of typical when you think of monetary reasons and stuff like that they want the money all that kind of stuff but uh, lots of double crossing lots of changes lots of surprises really like this one there's a nice uh, kind of interview with uh, an old interview with Paul Nashi. It's 28 minutes long where he talks about how he got his surname and everything like that. How he, and, and you always hear those stories, how they get their westernized name to kind of appeal to the westernized market, German market, American market, whatever. You hear like the John Morgan story where he came up with his Giovanni Regici, of course. But Paul Nashi's is pretty great uh, involving the name, the first name from a pope and the second name, um, a westernized version of his weightlifting friend's last name. So Paul Nashi, that's how it was created. But this is uh, just shows that how intelligent 
intelligent he was and how in depth he went in his research and how well read he was so just really like that special feature on the disc anyways i would recommend checking this one out it's kind of like the last uh, in uh, one of the last ones in, Na in uh, paul nashy's heyday i know they put out the beast and the sword that one too was kind of in the latter day in nashy films but uh, he actually directed this one so yeah i, I like this one i thought it was pretty good and for a while i was like am i gonna love this i don't know and then i was like yep I'm going to love this. And also, Paul Nashy can add to the list of monsters and creatures and killers he played uh, a night zombie or a, a, a guy in a night suit or whatever. Uh, you know, that's pretty cool. And, uh, of course, Paul Nashy has to have love scenes and fight scenes in his movies, and they're there. Plenty of nudity in this one. So, uh, yeah, Panic Beats, great stuff. Okay, the next one is from Arrow Video, and this is the El Duce tapes. And this is actually by the director who did um, Room 237 and The Nightmare. And I wasn't such a huge fan of The Nightmare, so I'm glad I didn't know he directed it before I went into it. Um, I love this movie. And I, I did, it's a documentary and it's El Duce. I'm like, who is El Duce? And then about 20 minutes into the movie, I was like, oh, I remember this guy from the 90s being on Jerry Springer and that kind of stuff. El Duce is uh, basically what happens is this is uh, falls a story of this kind of shock rock artist um, who says he sings rock or uh, rape rock. Um, but it's like this weird punk rock. I don't know what the hell it is. It's really weird. But he is this, this shock guy who says awful things and gets attention and just just does awful things all the time. And he, he just seems like a deplorable, absolute monster, right? But then we start to kind of tear away like the layers and we see this guy is actually not um, just that. He's an alcoholic. He's self-destructive. He doesn't believe in a lot of the things he says. It's just a shock value attention thing. And after a while, I started legitimately feeling sorry for him. And um, he's just a very, very much a different character that you want to see speak and, and talk just because you'd have no idea what he's going to do. And at one point, they say he's only in his 30s in the time, like 33 or 34. And you're just like, what? I thought this guy was like... 45 sick 50 so like the life is obviously taking a toll on him and you literally start to feel sorry for him even though he just the stuff he says is so awful and the way he goes about it and, and gets attention you're like you know what the idea how he it feels like he paved the way for so many people to do this kind of stuff but also his look his look is taken from uh um black sunday in the very opening with the the you know the executioner hood and all that kind of stuff and he is the front man for this band called the mentors um and, and has interviews with people from the time in, in his band from guar and stuff like that and you know these stories never end well whether it's gg allen hated gg G. Allen or railroad derailroaded with Wildman Fisher. They don't. They're always kind of sad or tragic or have you know some some moments in there where it gets really really turns. But um, yeah, this one this one was really interesting. I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was edited fantastic too. It edits it's edited in with '90s footage and just puts you in that time and place where you can understand how something like this could happen or how, how it works like that. But uh, yeah, I just thought that the interviews were uh, really really interesting and and, and basically. All, all, you know, he was an interesting person is basically what I'm getting at. And a lot of the people at the time, like Guar and stuff, talking about it was interesting to see how they thought of him and, and seeing the footage from Jerry Springer and all those live shows and everything like that. And then it would be cut in with like a commercial or like a, a movie at the time and stuff. And, and it just was really well done. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was an interesting story. Um, there's tons of special features on here, a bunch of B-sides footage and elongated interviews and the full tapes that the guy who originally started this documentary in the 90s at the time, full tapes of that, 34 minutes of that. See, because originally the guy found El Duce vomiting in a bush and uh, he just started kind of following him and made this documentary about him and everything like that. But it's, it's a very interesting look at this guy and a character and it shows you that not everyone's as appear as is who they appear to be or who they want the people to think they are. And it also shows you that, you know, there's characters out there like this that just do it for the attention and manipulate. It's just a very strange situation. Also a look into the music scene at the time. And it shows you that if you cracked out on a lot of these places, these these bands that are so uh, uh, upsetting and stuff like that, then basically, you know, you give them more attention than you thought. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, the records went out. Of, you know, they started selling even more. But uh, yeah, uh, just the, the lyrics of the song are absolutely ridiculous and stuff. And and, and they, they interview a woman on here who dances on stage. And she says, it's so ridiculous. Like, how can anyone take it seriously? And that that's somewhat too. Like a lot of the video nasties were like that. Like, yeah, well, how can anyone take any of this seriously? But um, besides then, when you get stuff like Hannibal Holocaust, it's a little bit different, right? That's been on your grave. You're like, eh. But, you know, this one is just very interesting and, and very well made, very well edited. And, you know, I, I really thought it was great. So check out the El Duce tapes. Whatever it 
takes for entertainment. How do you describe Mentor's music? What is it to you? Uh, male chauvinism rock. What songs do you think are his best songs? Um... I guess maybe Free Fix for a Fuck is a big favorite of mine. I think to a certain extent he's like a great artist in that he doesn't really give a damn what people think of him. I've got my lyrics and if they don't like it, they could eat shit out of my ass. And he was like running around the bus going dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig into people's face with this pee balloon. It's as easy as that. I mean, he's successful because he gets reaction. Uh. It's like there's a need for that in society. El Duce had a lot of weird aspects to his personality. What's that like, not having a home? Makes me want to drink more. Yeah. Uh, I think I'd make the first greatest dictator that this country has ever had. I'm American all the way. Okay, this next one here is from Arrow Video as well, and this is by Park Chan-wook, who did uh, Old Boy and uh, tons and tons of movies. And this is made in 2000. This is Joint Security Area, or JSA. This is pretty much his first big film. Uh, yeah, I had not seen this. It, it has a lot of familiar faces. I won't butcher their names for you guys, but uh, the father from Parasite is one of the main characters in here. Um, and yeah, this is a tremendously well-acted, well-scripted film. This follows the story of basically two sergeants, one on the North Korea, one on the South Korea side. Um, and it, it's like a Ra uh, Rashomon story where it likes told from different points of view and that kind of stuff. And you see it right in the beginning, the shooting. But um, basically both sides are declaring that something else happened. They send in this joint security, you know, like this person in there. I think it's like, that's kind of their name in there. She's basically neutral. She goes in, she speaks Korean, but she's not, not doesn't live in Korea. She speaks English and everything like that. She's supposed to go in and determine actually what happened. So she starts to interview both sides and everything to figure it out. And at first you think um, they're saying that either possible that the North Koreans kidnapped the South Korean and he defended himself. The North Koreans are saying he crossed the border legally or whatever and, and just attacked some people. But we got to figure out the truth. And um, yeah, so basically after that we kind of have flashbacks and it starts off in the beginning and we see their story unfold sometimes going back to, you know, this character to try to do more, you know, just mystery work and kind of figure everything out. But uh, what, what, what unfolds is you think maybe it's a story of revenge or violence or hatred, but it's really not. It's a story about tragedy and friendship. And they say, like, um, although there are different beliefs and different political systems and completely at war, they both are of the same blood. They both were from Korea. They both lived under the same country for so long. And it's just a very kind of tragic thing. But they end up starting this friendship where the South Korean, the North Korean guy saves a guy from a landmine, the South Korean guy. And he crosses over at night with one of his, his private, his friend, his brother, basically his girlfriend's brother. And they start to kind of hang out um, after hours and, and, the sergeant along with a private of his, they're, they, four of them become friends and they start this really close relationship. And of course, you know, it's going to end in a shooting, but getting to that is the interesting part. You really start to become very invested in the characters and you really got to see what's going to happen. But just, I thought this was an amazing film. I thought it was well acted, well shot, very touching. And although the shootings and stuff are really grueling, it's not really about that. Um, yeah, just a lot of good special features on here as well. There was a commentary of Simon Ward. But um, the one I really liked is, uh, I can't think of the guy who does it, but he basically goes down basically goes down and starts talking a lot about his films and his you know his rise and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, really thought this one was great. Uh, can't wait to watch Thirst for Blind Spot, and I'm eventually going to watch Stoker for 22 Shots Patreon. Somebody picked that for me. And uh, I definitely want to get to the Old Boy Vengeance Trilogy when I can. But anyways, a great release of a movie that I had not seen, and I think some more people, uh, I know I'm sure lots of people know it, but it's just one that uh, passed me by, and I had not heard people bring it up when they bring his name up. I hear, of course, of Thirst and Stoker and the Vengeance Trilogy, but not this one. But this one's a fantastic movie. Loved it. Good stuff. And it looks great, sounds great. 2000 has a, has a decent amount of features on there some archival stuff as well so yeah joint security area this is a very special case our job is to find out not who but why 
perpetrator is already in custody, we even have his confession. Your ultimate goal is to remain perfectly neutral and not to provoke either the South or the North. Okay, this one is from 2005. This is Sir 505, and this is Ty West's The Roost. And I actually had never seen this. I, I remember, I think I started it in 2005 and never finished it. Ty West, I'm kind of a mixed bag for me. Like, I like, um, never saw The Innkeepers, but I like, I remember liking House of the Devil and The Sacrament, hated the VHS segment, hated the ABC's A Death segment. And so, yeah, I was like, I, I don't know. So, this one is his first feature film. It's got to be on a budget, and it's, it's pretty successful for a budget film. And I don't want to say that like, oh, it's pretty successful a budget film, but it, it's not perfect. And I feel like this story was, uh, it's, it has a horror host in the very beginning played by Tom Noonan. And it's kind of like the black and white kind of cheesy thing. And the movie's tone is completely not that like the roost is a creepy, uh, atmospheric movie with teens that are being like bitten by bats in terms of zombies. And I know it sounds like a B movie, but it doesn't feel like one doesn't play like a corny one or doesn't try to be too serious and is dumb. Like the movie just doesn't really feel like it needs a horror host. And my, I think I read this. I'm not sure if originally this was supposed to be two shorts or two 45 minute shorts and the horror host wrap around and they couldn't do it. So they just kind of elongated the bat story. So uh, it feels a little padded out. If that makes any sense, a little bit uneventful, even though it has a lot of atmosphere and, and building suspense, it does feel a little padded added out a little bit of uh, kind of meandering but basically four friends are on their way to a wedding um and they back hits their car they they crash their car they kind of wander off to a barn which is the closest area it's dark it's country road and they're attacked by bats um and of course the bats bite you they turn you to zombies so they basically have to survive the night the characters are not very likable or interesting they're not hateable they're just average milk toast characters kind of uninteresting i don't want to hear them talk about how they don't want to go to this wedding i don't really want to hear them talk at all it's just kind of you know boring just very generic maybe maybe they're too realistic for their own good uh but they're also very boring it's just not very entertaining to watch for an hour and 20 minutes um didn't care for them really but uh the special effects the practical effects when they're there are really good they're bloody it does take about 45 minutes for anything significant to happen even though like i said it's it's mostly building suspense um people be like it's a slow burn okay but uh yeah i think by the end of it it's fairly decent i don't really think that the um the kind of goofy wraparound thing works for this movie i just don't I, I just don't think the tones mash very well. And also, like I said, I, I not like I said, but I think there's two versions of this movie. I have the DVD, but I watched it online. And I think I remember there being like a radio talk on the radio. Like every time the radio's on, where there would be like a horror host telling a story or something like that. And it not being in here, maybe that kind of changed the tone of the movie completely. This one just seems more dark and serious. But the version I watched didn't have that. So anyways, uh, The Roost, check it out. I think it's decent. I don't love it. But I'm not... not mad i watched it for 05 i'm glad i finally checked it out and uh it's a, it's a fairly interesting zombie movie like this look of this one and this tone and feel of it i wish it was just more uh it's it just a little longer and it started a little bit quicker and didn't have the horror host wrap around i think if we got bigger with it it could be really really fun um or, or not even fun but just really really scary because it does have its moments and larry fessendent's in it of course gotta love that and you know what happens to larry fessendent in movies so yeah that is the roost Okay, I know that you're wondering why I'm doing it from this angle, but that's because dummy me forgot 
got. I'm having an off day. I'm really having an off day today. This is the Patreon pick for Jason Willard. This is Seized. This is by, um, I think it's what, um, what this director did, um, Boyka 2 and 3 with Scott Atkins, and he did Ninja 1 and 2, Ninja 2 as Scott Atkins, so he's familiar with working with them. This one is called Seized. Um, it follows Scott Atkins, is, um, of course he's in it, is he's like this kind of retired agent who used to do hits for like a, a CIA kind of program or somebody like that. And basically his son is kidnapped by this uh, kind of drug lord in uh, Mario Van Peebles, which was great seeing him in here, and he's forced to carry out a bunch of hits on drug cartels so Mario Van Peebles can be top of the heap. Uh, Mario Van Peebles is also working with someone from uh, Scott Atkins' past. So basically what it is is Scott Atkins is wired with a camera and some weapons and an armored car and he has to go around and kill a bunch of drug cartels. So um, Scott Atkins, I, I think he's a pretty solid actor. I always enjoy him. I said he knows how to fight and he knows how to act which is a rare combination for a lot of these guys. And um, I think some of his better performances really are Boyka. I think he gets that Russian kind of tough character down. I thought he's also really great in Avengement. I think when he's playing a bigger character, like almost like a character, like big character type, you know what I mean? I think he's a little bit better. I, I enjoy him more. This one, he's kind of playing a standard kind of dad, kind of walking the line assassin. I think he's a little bit more flat or maybe the character's just not as interesting or as fun to me. And he's trying to save his son. His son, you know, child actor, a little shaky. Um, but a lot of the movie is Scott Atkins just running around shooting a bunch of people and Mario Van Peebles and his gang kind of reacting to it. Mario Van Peebles is also intimidating him throughout the entire movie and talking to him and he's definitely chewing the scenery and enjoying what he's doing. He has some good lines and he's having some fun. I always liked Mario Van Peebles from Posse to, um, you know, a lot of the films he did. Even Solo, I remember him in. But I always adored Posse. I always thought he was great in that. And I think he actually, did he direct that one, if I'm not mistaken, or was definitely involved with the, the film uh, behind the scenes as well. But I felt like he always should have got a better kind of shake than he did or where he landed. But like I said, it was nice seeing him pop up in here and some of his lines are fun. And he's definitely chewing the scenery in his cowboy hat and uh, having just a blast. And he they made his character a little bit more in-depth than your typical evil drug cartel villain. He he has a little bit some depth and I can depth and I can imagine he was just like, I don't want to play this character like this. Can I do this and be a little bit more redeeming? But uh, yeah, there's more shooting than fighting for Scott Atkins. There's a lot more, you know, gun play here and there's some CGI blood splatter. It's not gratuitously gory when it comes to like practical effects. There's not really much there. So the action is just okay for me. Like I think that I like my, you know, gun shootout stuff to be a little bit more practical than this. This is almost like a low rent John Wick movie in the action kind of deal, but it's not absolutely horrible horrible or anything like that. I found it uh, per, like a fairly enjoyable. Um, didn't hate it. Didn't love it. Um, like I said, the ending left it open for maybe possibly a little bit more seized action. But all in all, I think it's a standard kind of action flick of the time. Not great. Not horrible at all. Very passable. Um, Scott Ankins fights well and shoots well. I wish there was more fighting, wish there was a little less of the kind of shooting they do in it. I love shootouts, but really I just never feel like they could capture... The shootouts have not been the same since... Um, I don't know, like since 2000, 2002, before that, you know, it's very hard for that kind of, that style, squibs and, and real shots going off, except for Free Fire, which I thought was pretty fun. But anyway, Seized, I feel like it's okay. Um, I, I definitely feel like there's better Scott Atkins outings. Um, so Avengement or Ninja 2 or the Boyka movies, I think, are a, a safer way to go if you're looking for action from uh, Scott Atkins. But this one is okay, and I didn't enjoy, I didn't dislike my time with it, so that's Seized. Hey guys, we're here for Blind Spot. Spot. and uh we're blind right now with these lights in our face um so this one is black swan this is my pick this came out in 2010 it was a movie that i always heard good things about i never watched it and it was just it always i think the reputation's always been good i think it got better and i think this is more of a horror movie than i thought it actually would be it's by director darren aronowski who did requiem for a dream and pie and mother um yeah so this stars natalie portman Mm -hmm. from the professionals what i know her from mostly uh milas kunis from that 70s show geez barbara hershey winona ryder vincent cassell from irreversible um and brotherhood of the wolf so amazing cast everybody mm -hmm. in here is tremendous and uh this shares a lot of sentiment to me to something like a, um you know what i would say it's a mixture of polanski and argento yeah i would say it's definitely has like an argento feel to it being like you know dance and and art related <laughs> it's, it's very euro horror mm -hmm. or stuff like that but it also feels like polanski too like the psychological stuff and the cracking and stuff but i think 
I think I, it's going to be blasphemy to everybody. I prefer it over the Polanski apartment trilogy, but that's just personally probably because it has the Argento flares and I'm more of a Euro whore guy. Right. Than, uh, so anyways, the plot follows uh, basically, what are they, ballerinas mm -hmm. who are competing for a role in The Swan, right? Is that what the play, the musical Swan is Lake. Called? Swan Lake. Um, Natalie Portman's been doing this for her life. She has a, a helicopter mom. Natalie Portman's in like her 20s, so her mom is just vicariously living through her. She was a dancer and she never succeeded so she's always constantly putting pressure on her daughter and babying her almost to a point where she's a child Natalie Portman is super repressed sexually and in every other kind of aspect Vincent Cassell is running this show and um, the thing about this role that she's trying out for it's dual roles to play the white swan and the black swan and uh, she sort of has to lose herself to become the black swan um, so she is cast at the role and Vincent Cassell is pushing her to become something she's not to lose you know control and um, with the whole setup of her life and everything that's going on it's not very good for Natalie Portman to lose control but she starts kind of a, a weird relationship with uh, Miles Kunis um, somewhat sexual maybe possibly question mark definitely <laughs> tiny for well somebody is um mm -hmm. but maybe not both sides uh and it turns into a nightmare of hallucinatory insanity where you don't know what's real and what's not and mm -hmm. in menacing body horror like yeah this movie had me cringing so many times because you can obviously... It sets up that she obviously had her... It never comes out and says that she had problems in the past. It does to a certain point, but immediately you know. You know there's so much stuff hidden and what's in her. It's just so much stuff going on here. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean she she is repressed, like, you know, and during the casting... In, like, in every she, aspect of her life. Yeah, in every aspect of her life. And um, uh, the main guy... Vincent Cassell is like Cassell if it was the like, White Swan, like you yeah, would I would it. I would cast you, yeah, but you know she can't like become that like dark version of herself, and that's what she sees in uh, the Mila Kunis character. She sees that darkness within right. her, but she also is pining for her because of that, and it's just like on so many different layers. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just so much intensity. Um, it builds up. It, it, it's like an hour and 50 minutes. The pacing is perfect. Never bored. Keeps you intrigued the entire time. Mm -hmm. um, the acting's tremendous. Like I said, it's, everybody in here is top notch, um, especially Portman and uh, uh, Vincent Cassell, I think, are the shining stars in here. Cassell is a is one of these actors that's just, I'm always happy to see him, whether if it's an underwater or irreversible or a brotherhood of the wolf or anything like that. He's just, uh, he goes for it. These, a lot of these French actors, I feel like are no holes barred. <laughs> like, like they're not going to hold back. And I don't think he holds back at all. No, but, uh, Portman, man, what a, a nightmare performance. Right. She, she does fantastic. I think, um, my favorite actress was, uh, Mila Kunis. I think yeah, she's great. I, I just enjoy watching her and I wish I cheated more than, <laughs> what she ended up doing it's just high stakes like art like thing where mm -hmm. the, the dancing and stuff and, and you feel the stress you feel the pressure and i know like i think that this is a better more successful film than neon demon and neon demon has that whole highly competitive although it is different i think this one is more straightforward than neon demon and i although you know it's psychological and you're not sure exactly what is going on like what's real or what's not by the end of it you're pretty sure exactly what happened it all comes mm -hmm. together and it, it plays into the play uh, so perfectly and it's just everything's set up wonderfully i think this is a fantastic movie and i don't necessarily we could probably spoil it because i'm sure everybody's seen it mm -hmm. that's what but um i think this is probably darren aronofsky's best film I, I think it's better than Requiem for a Dream. I think that there's... Requiem is a masterpiece, and I've seen it a handful of times, and it's miserable to watch, but I don't know if I um, the rewatch value on Requiem is as strong as this would be on Black Swan. I've never seen any of his other movies. This is Really? You've seen one. Noah. Have I seen Noah? It's the uh, Noah's Ark movie. He did that. You hated it. You went to theaters and saw it, but that was kind of a flop of his. Wait, I saw it in theaters? Yeah, you told me about it. You saw it, you and your family went and saw it, and you said it, everybody disliked it? No, it was, that was Moses. Moses. It was okay. Moses. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I got Noah and Moses confused. <laughs> my, biblical, my biblical figures are mixed up. Oh, that was a terrible movie. I don't think that was the one. I think he did Noah, which was very strange <coughs> from my understanding. But Mother, I, okay. I see some similarities, although I think this is much stronger than Mother. Um... I don't know. I like I said without expl like the the small little steps are just so in intense here. Like the hangnail. Mm -hmm. Like I literally, I was like, no, you're supposed to go the other way. Oh, there's all kinds of like like just like she, every character gets like broken in this movie. Like she like slams her mom's oh, hand, the in, hand the door. in the door. Was rough. Um, 
you know, but like at one point she's like actually like transforming into like a like a swan and like like all the quills start like. And it also doubles with her goosebumps during the yes. sex scene, which I thought was great, and the quills and the the, the goosebumps all mixed together. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I don't really know um, how how what we could carry on about this, but I said like the uh, psychological aspects are perfect. How how she transforms and finds herself in there, and how it starts off subtly and and becomes more and more uh, pronounced as it goes on. Like she'll mm-hmm. see Milos Kunas in the shadows and at first glimpse she'll see herself and this dark figure of herself like a, oh and she's like and then the light will change and it'll be uh and she's like oh okay so it's like it's it's like her finding herself but she's also finding that repressed part of herself but some of it is just awful at the same time mm-hmm. like going too far in there um and it all comes together like right the first 10 minutes you know exactly where it's going Oh yeah. Where she has to find herself and the dark repressed point is going to be all in the musical and on the black swan and everything like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it, it's great. And it's so weird. Like these big kind of horror psychological movies that are like elaborate and art filled, um, like with dancing, like mm-hmm. it, like we they got go the Suspiria remake and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And all the Euro horror. I don't know what it is about high stress dancing and horror that just makes for a perfect combination. Well, it's just like if you take a bunch of girls and then like put them through a stressful situation and then make one of them slightly off, it's like, that's horror. I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, uh, it worked for Argento for 40 years. So. Yeah. And, you know, Suspiria originally was supposed to be, like, 13, 14-year-old girls. Oh, really? Because the Three Mothers is basically like kind of like an old tale, so it would have been better if it was kids with the witches, but they changed it around a bit. That's why some of the girls are saying such weird things, like, you're a snake, snake, you know, oh. stuff like that. So, But, yeah, I, I love Suspiria. I remember I heard that on the uh, Exploding Heads podcast. I knew that already, but they kind of re, uh, re- like I refreshed my memory, and I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I watching am this help, too. Yeah, I am partial to the remake of Suspiria over the original, but that's a different discussion. For... Nonsense. I like both a lot, but the original always stands for, stands higher for me. But... I will say that this one is almost as good as Swan Princess. I know What's Swan been... Princess? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an animated movie based on Swan Lake. Where This princess... one is better than that. I haven't seen it, but it's better. I know it. I don't know. Swan Princess has a talking frog and a talking penguin thing. This has a, a bird lady. It's sort of Swan Princess. It's in the title. I don't care. <laughs> but uh, I loved it. Um, I don't think it's in either of the books, so we're not going to bother. No. Um, 9.5 out of 10 for the first time watched. Loved I, it. Loved I give it. it a 4.5 out of 5. Yeah, it's was, it was almost perfect for me. I, I was really surprised with it. I was cause So many times you watch so many movies, and you'll just be like, okay, this is losing my interest, or, you know, that was cool, that was different. But this one just worked. Everything worked for me, and I was really happy with it. Next week is what? Um, Kronos. Kronos. That's your pick. That's the Guillermo del Toro vampire. But I also so I haven't seen Chronos. It's the only, right. I think it's the only horror film besides, well, Pacific Rim's not really horror. It's the only movie by Del Toro I haven't seen is Chronos and Pacific Rim. I've seen everything else. I think Chronos might be the only one I have yet to see. And although I didn't really watch all of Devil's Backbone. But... Oh, I love Devil's Backbone. It's a classic. I mean, I'll pick Dan's Labyrinth every day. Yeah, but anyways, uh, we're good on this. Um, mm-hmm. So we're out of here. I know it's going to be a those reviews were pretty quick. I'm sorry about that. Like I said, I had to watch crappy movies, uh, but um, not these movies. The movies I had to watch for 22 shots. I had to watch crappy movies. Questions. Ilk vomit. Wait, are you and Jeremy standing during the blind spot segment? Yes, we were. Because I think I don't like how it's cramped in here now with the two people. So, Nick Mua, did you ever lose your patience with the movie that was just getting released? That just wasn't getting released? Even a movie you were looking forward to? Uh, I used to, but now I'm just like, eh. I got so much to watch, but I do lose interest. Like, I'm just like, I don't care anymore. Like, I like, oh, that sounds cool. And then like 30 years, like the new mutants, if I ever had any interest, it was most certainly lost. Cause it's like, oh, we're just funny. I just became a joke. It became funny. Like I wasn't really that interested, but people were like, oh, it has dream warriors qualities. I was like, oh man, I'm going to check it out. And then like postpone, postpone. And I was just like, oh, that, that movie it wasn't released yet. Like I just didn't care. Didn't watch it. So I, I guess, I guess you could say lose patience. Maybe that. Um, some other stuff. House Thousand Corpses felt like it was coming out forever. Drove me nuts. Um, back then. Now I just don't care as much. Have you had a chance to watch any of the Hex Media Blu-rays yet? I really enjoy Lords of Tears, but others seem to, others seem to like the unkindness of Ravens more. Um, what was the one I did? I did watch one of them. Where is it? I watched the uh, Devils. Uh, I'm trying to look at the name. The Devils Machine, which got re-released as uh, 
a ton of on. And I like that one. I thought it was pretty solid. I remember Lords of Tears was good too. Um, I didn't absolutely love it. I do want to check out the other two, Black Gloves and Unkindness of Ravens. I do have them, but I did not get a chance to watch those two. Do, did or do the local department stores in your part of the world sell DVDs and Blu-rays? They do over here. Only in the last years, the quantity has declined, mostly Blockbusters and Disney. Um, yeah, like if you go in a gas station, they'll have some DVDs here and there, but people don't typically buy from there. I mean, I don't, but they rarely have anything worth picking up. Then answers, basically I ask you, which who is your favorite contributor to special feature supplements and you know stuff like that, featurettes? So uh, George Hilton says, I like Kim Newman's contributions. Ken Coakley, I like Tim Lucas' commentaries, especially on the Mario Bava movies. Um, first and foremost, let me say, I really like Kel Allinger and Sam Deegan. I like Stephen Thrower, I like Tim Lucas, I like Troy Howard. Those are the ones I'll go with off the top of my head. Uh, so, Ken Coakley, I like Tim Lucas commentaries, especially on Mario Bava movies. I also like the fan commentaries on some of the Friday the 13th movies by Adam Green and Joe Lynch. I also find the commentaries on Paul Nashie's movies by the guys at Nashie cast to be quite informative. I also really like Michael Felsher, but he's mostly behind the scenes, so people forget to mention him. He doesn't, you know, he'll do like, he'll do the commentaries with the director and stuff like that, but he's not really the one to do the whole commentary himself, so. Uh, Nick Mula, oh boy, choosing between special feature contributors is like picking your favorite kid. Difficult, but not impossible. <laughs> Okay. Cat Ellinger, Kim Newman, Stephen, and Alan Jones come to mind. Stephen Thrower and Alan Jones come to mind. Their participation in bonus features always guarantees fun and interesting tidbits. I also like commentaries by Hysteria Continues podcast members. Mark Commode and his rants about censorship is the coward's way out. The devil's highly amusing. Mark Gaddis, lover of all kinds of horror, can do no wrong in my special feature wise. Uh, Dominic Fabri, great question. Mine is definitely Stephen Thrower. Adrian Roberts, Sean Clark. Renee Rower, Kim Newman, Stephen Thrower. Tim. Timothy Matthew Hayes, Tim Lucas, Peter England, Kim Newman, Keith Foy Jr., Roy Frumkeys, Jason Fetters, Tom Weaver, uh, Mark Eric Jones, Stephen Biro, and uh, Stephen Thrower, uh, Susie Ayala. Uh, can't go wrong with people named Stephen. Good choices. And Mark Humphreys. I am sometimes sold on the release if they have contributors from someone I respect. Kim Newman and Sean Clark's Horse Hollowed Grounds are great, but I would probably pick Stephen Thrower for his knowledge of Jess Franco and Lucio Fulci. Bex Boutwin. Cat Ellinger and Sam Deacon, Brian Young, Jason Beam, David Gibson, Troy Haworth puts out amazing commentaries. His wealth of knowledge is top tier. And then Troy Haworth actually thanks David Gibson. Thank you. Nice to be included in such a distinguished company. Very cool. David Luton. There's a few. My faves are Troy Haworth, Cat Ellinger, Stephen Thrower, Alan Jones, and Kim Newman. Troy's commentary and air release of Bird with the Crystal Plumage is excellent. Uh, Christopher Bickle, Paul Talbot, which is very cool. Paul, Tal Paul Talbot does the uh, Charles Bronson ones. I, it reminds me, I still need to buy the Death Wish 3 from uh, uh, Scorpion. Uh, Donald Plett, Sean Clark, Kim Newman, Stephen Thrower, Troy Haworth. Uh, Michael Matson, David Dayval, his commentary is always entertaining and informative. I also really like him, especially when him and David Dakota are paired up. They're very hilarious together. Uh, Sam Edwards, the ones you just listed, plus Mr. Troy Haworth. There's a slew of others as well, but those off the top of my head are top notch. Chris Lax, Michael Felsher from Red Shirt Pitchers. Uh, Lee Jones, thrower, well spoken, well researched, generally good taste. Uh, Madeline Deering, Tim Lucas. Rob Kopinski, Stephen Thrower for sure. His work on the Fulci releases have been insane. Building Fulci City is one fine example on the Arrow release. He also has a piece, a fine piece of work on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 Arrow release. I got his Beyond Terror book, um, which is excellent. For me, he definitely is the top of the heap. Stephen Friedel, list himself. Uh, James D. Coax, Kim Newman, Richard Stringham, Michael Felsher, and Heather Buckley. Uh, Michael Felsher, <laughs> list Felsher, really? You. Or, eh. Uh, Tim Walker, Tim Lucas, Troy Howard, The Hysteria Continues, and The Nashy Cast, guys. And we have some comments. There's a lot of comments, so I'm going to read them. Why not? It's a short video anyways. Um, Isamisio, I vaguely remember Rampo Noir. Time for a revisit sometime soon. Big fan of Asano. Uh, it sounds crazy. Enjoyed the descent, but have come down on it over the years. Need to check out Synchronic. No shame in the pervert card. Wear that shit proud. Great update. Pervert card. Um, Eberhaman, 49. And he, Ken Barnett is just an alias for two guys who directed, um, he's talking about the Dark Tower movie, Freddie Francis and Ken Wienerhort, which I thought was the case, but I wasn't 100%. Glad he cleared that up because Freddie Francis, of course, a hammer guy, um, Doctor and the Devils, and then Ken Wienerhorn did Return of the Living Dead Part 2, Eyes of a Stranger, I think he did, and Shockwaves. He did one of the ones, I think it's Eyes of a Stranger. Uh, kind of an underrated horror guy. I know he wasn't a big horror directing a horror fan, but he still made some cool ones. And then Oop Pizza, or Pizza, Id sounds totally up my alley. Good suggestion there. Domino D, I love Forbidden World and Galaxy of Terror so much. They're just so corny. They are, uh, 
that they are fun. I just picked up the blue steel books for both recently. I, I tried to get Galaxy Terror, it was sold out at the time. Dr. Snuff, yes, Forbidden World is dumb, but has everything you want in a monster movie. As a big, nasty mutant monster, gore, nudity, cool setting, outlandish 80s synthesizer soundtrack, atmosphere, and more importantly, it's super entertaining. I really love the movie. Yeah, I enjoy it. It's just so dumb. I, I like it. Tim Hayes, he says Galaxy of Terror is a bit better. I would agree. Uh, Micah Dube, love your Monster Squad poster. Thank you. Tim Hayes, he has some information about Orgy of the Living Dead for Blast Week. Orgy of the Living Dead was a movie Charles Band released on VHS tapes years ago as Return of the Zombies. When I used to have a subscription to Full Moon Streaming, I believe Orgy of the Living Dead was streaming on there as Return of the Zombies. But I think it was a VHS tape of the old Wizard video VHS tape. Troma put out a special edition DVD as The, Hang as the Hanging Woman, which I had, I knew. Um, since that was a U.S. theatrical release title, but it was full screen. Troma used to have The Hanging Woman on YouTube, but it looked slightly only better than a VHS tape. I was glad the blonde-haired actress from the movie was later in The Vampire's Night Orgy. Night Orgy. She looked much prettier in that film. I have not seen Vampire's Night Orgy. Then we have David Leather. He says, I see you as an archivist and historian. Your collection will become invaluable as Big Brother increasingly begins to limit access to stream media until the grid is completely shut off by elites to those of us who are not in re-education camps. Now... I don't think I'm an archivist and a historian at all, but I like movies. Um, now, the funny thing is, is Big Brother is not the ones who are limiting it. It's big corporations like Disney. And Disney is the one who I think of, number one, who buys all the big titles. Like, they bought Fox, and they're the ones who censored their films. I don't like that. I mean, honestly... I don't like censorship at all. I don't think anybody does that collects film or media. It's so stupid. And I hate that idea that you literally... Can, they're, they're censoring movies that have been released for years. Why not just put a bumper in the beginning that says this movie's made this time? Get over it. Or this movie's made this time. Please note it may be offensive to people. I, who cares? Like, or just... I don't know. Like I said, I had that reasoning on streaming services. You can put off the trigger warnings, turn them on or off, if you like. Um, but... I'm not that paranoid about it. I do think that eventually there'll be a lot of movies that do disappear because they won't be on streaming and stuff like that. That's why when people are like, so I guess I am an archivist in some some sort of way, but they'll be like, oh, why do you buy all those movies? Who cares? You can just watch it streaming. It's like, literally, can I watch any of these streaming? Can I just find anything streaming? Like, I'm trying to find a movie that I know is not streaming. Like, oh, uh, there's just so much stuff that's probably not going to be streaming. Like the Deadly Trackers is movie, for example. It might be streaming, but it might disappear. And it's on a Blu-ray, but there's so many movies that aren't going to be there that are going to disappear or be cut or they'll release a full screen or a widescreen version and the preferred version is the other version. Just, I don't know. Like there, I guess I am an archivist in a lot of ways and I do think that some of it might disappear, but I doubt that they care enough to completely deplete it it'll just be the big corporations trying to get rid of it more so the companies themselves to to get away from backlash of people because a lot of people still don't understand that these movies were pieces of time you know what i mean like it's strange that cinema is the one that gets the heat but uh, music i mean sometimes it does but cinema seems maybe it's just i pay att more attention to cinema but like people do they walk in like an art exhibit and see the art on the wall and say geez man well, chronos eating his kids really bothers me let's get rid of that we can't have that here anymore or the screaming guy in the bridge is just a inaccurate perception of how crazy people think and it's not how people i have mental illness and i don't like seeing that like it's just when you start going down the censorship rabbit hole it's just like okay don't watch it. That's all you have to do is not watch it. Like, <laughs> it's like, end of story. I get it. Like, or have two versions of it. But okay, Mike uh, Abby, I like when you show the trailer while giving a review. I think it I think it works. Keep up the great content. Thank you. Travis Wright, I watched Rip Rest in Pieces this past weekend. I had a good time. Got the Blu-ray through Kickstarter. I'm sorry people are being jerks. It was my first view at watching a Dustin Mills movie. Is there any particular one you would recommend next? That should have been questions. Thanks, I appreciate it. I mean, I don't care if people are like, oh, you suck in this, Mr. Parker. Uh, get better or or do this better or you're you're stuttering here or you're talking too fast there. I'm all up to open criticism. But like, when, like I said, when people just make stupid statements like oh, 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 compared to evil dead it's just like, you don't know what you're talking about just shut up you're dumb um i don't mind Chris, uh, constructive criticism or anything like that but uh, it's just people are stupid and downloading it illegally and then like posting half a star getting like it it's like all right whatever dude just give me a reason you know whatever i'm sorry sound like a baby over here but so uh, i i always liked him Inv invalid was one i liked by dustin but most people like the puppet monster massacre 
I, I like it, of course, but that's like the bigger one he did first. That was like his first movie. He had a lot of a lot of popularity. Um, I would say Slaughterhouse, Slumber Party, and Invalid. And then we have 81 Oak Ridge. I love the Amityville story of Robert DeFeo killing his family, which is what sequel or prequel with Amityville 2, The Possession. It's just a lot more creepy and disturbing, and the practical effects are amazing. And then we have Peek and Boo. Uh, LOL, print the pervert card. I need one, too. I'll buy that for a dollar to quote Robocop commercial. She was hanged, but was still hung, or the other way around. I actually had to look it up. So this is how a page described it. Hang can only refer to someone's death by hanging. If you are wondering, is it hanged or hung? Establish whether a deadly action has taken place and hanged versus hung. Summary. Using the correct past tense of to hang is simply once you make the distinction between its use for capital punishment and its more incorrect meaning. All you need to remember is that hanged has to do with a person's demise and hung is used for all other definitions of to hang, including... In, 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 ingo doma, ingomatic verbal phrases that contain it hung, hang, hung jury stuff like that so he has all these listings darn the web addresses is long enough as the text itself describing hang hung speaking of Rampo Noor the Japanese writer Taro Hiro was pen pal was pen pal with Edgar Allan Poe and changed his name writing only name to Ego Rampa Rampo to basically pay respect to Poe's work if you pronounce the name Ego Guada Rampo quickly, it sounds like Edgar Allan Poe, at least how the Japanese would pronounce it. Rampo also, in some way, started the torture porn genre in 1931 as he wrote Moju, aka Blind Beast, whom was made into an amazing movie in 1969. The original title, Rampo Jinko, literally translates to Rampo Hell. As for Japanese art, books, movies, manga, anime, and music, there is a saying In art, anything goes. The only thing that they can't do is showing genitals or mocking disabled people. Therefore, <laughs> is. I'm not going to try that, but um, Inugaba Rampo Zinsu, Horror of Malformed Men, is one of the few movies that is banned in Japan, which I have seen, and it's a, it's a good movie. Sorry for a long text. Great video as always. Be safe. And Chester22, please forgive me, but the word is especially, not especially. Regardless, I always enjoy your videos. Keep up the great work. Especially. 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 There we go. See? It's a word that I've always said wrong and never really paid much attention to it. Somebody pointed out. See, I will try to not say that anymore. Sorry about that, but it's also... <laughs> it is what it is. Old habits die hard, right? So, uh, anyways, uh, we're going to hop into the update. Okay, and I'm going to ask the question of the week. Since I completely forgot, um, this week I want to ask you what your favorite taglines in films are. Horror films. Let's go horror films. I know I've asked this question before, but we got a bunch of VHS here. So, I basically want anything i'm just gonna grab one um the apple gates and just read the tagline meet the new bugs on the block look how sun faded this sucker is um just like yeah just tell me some of your favorite taglines on horror films um yeah I, i've always liked the taglines on there one of my favorite you know, pieces has a great one um popcorn has a great one uh, uh grab a bag go home in a box just so many good horror taglines. And don't just pick your favorite movie. Pick something that you know the tagline is great. Um, because so many people just pick their favorite movie. Like, I know I'm gonna, I am gonna, know The Thing has a great tagline, but there's going to be a million Thing taglines. And a, but just pick pick a great tagline, a horror movie tagline. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, hear them. Okay, let's start this update. First up is the 4K of Old Boy. Yeah, I had to, I had to grab it. I had the uh, Arrow box set, but when I saw they had the 4K, I was like, yep. I'm doing it. Couldn't help it. So, uh, yeah, I've actually never seen it. It's one of the biggest blind spots I have. Can't wait to watch it. Top into the DVDs. We have Murders in a Rug Morgue. Uh, popped up on uh, Amazon for like 15 bucks. It's the uh, Scream Factory edition. Great price for it, so I grabbed it. Then we have Host. Got this for 10 bucks. Uh, I enjoyed this one. Thought it was pretty good. Shutter exclusive. Very short. Very... Uh, well made, has good scares. The scares work. We have Small Soldiers. Uh, I have not seen this in years. Always remember liking it. I think it's a solid film. Joe Dante in it. Now, I'll never forget the uh, Phil Hartman line. I think World War II is the best war. Uh, always laughed at that. And then we have here, we have Shinobi Girl, the movie, and a Death Trance. I hear Death Trance is pretty cool. I don't know much about the other one. But uh, yeah, going to check these out. This is a, a Tokyo Shock uh, Blu-ray, double feature. Good price on it. Then we have these. Some of these are doubles. I bought this big lot of a bunch of uh, uh, Tokyo Shock DVDs uh, together. This is Black Angel Collection. It was a, it was well priced lot. That's why I grabbed it. I wanted a couple in there, but I figured, why not? Uh, but yeah. 
I think I had that one already. This one I did not have Goin 1 and 2, or Gonin. So add sex in two fisted mix of action and bloodlust. So yeah, this is well priced. Very cool. I've been grabbing a lot of these screen of uh, these Tokyo Shocks. Then we have Takashi Miike collection, four four disc set from the uh, Maki collection, Bodyguard Kimba one and two, and Family one and two. These look like early Yakuza movies for Miike. Well priced though again, part of the set, four movies in there. Then we have this bad boy, Tales of Terror from Tokyo and all over Japan, the collection. This has over 500 minutes on five DVDs. Very cool. Um, yeah, so this is basically like a, um, a TV series with a bunch of stuff on there. So, yeah. Then we have, which I already had these already, Art of the Devil 1, 2, and 3. It's the trilogy. So, not seen these. This one I picked up uh, because I, I didn't know it had a DVD. I watched it online and I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know it was out. Um, so I grabbed this, The Man Behind the Scissors, uh, 2005 movie. Tokyo Shock released it as well. This is a really great one from the director of Evil Dead Trap. Great stuff. So I picked it up. Then we have The Man Eater, which is another Tokyo Shock one uh, based on a true story. Um, yeah, this is a Thai movie from my understanding. Not for the faint of heart. Then we have a double here, Tokyo Shock double feature, Die Covery and Taxi Tonight. I think uh, Taxi Tonight is a Thai film, so yeah. Then we have, it's a it's a big update, kind of, so we have some more Nakatsu Erotic Films collection, Flight Attendant Scandal. So I'm pulling out my pervert card again. So uh, I really should print out pervert cards. I've had two people, three people tell me that. So um, Nurse Diary, uh, Wicked Finger. And then we got Story of White Coat, Indecent X. Home Stretch here. Dark Tales of Japan. Lots of Asian stuff. Grabbing a lot of these that I don't think will ever really hit Blu-ray or HD. So look at it. they had a UHD of it. That's great. Not a UHD, but what were those little things? I don't remember what they're called. And then Mystery and Whore Tales Volume One. And last, but hopefully not least, we have Scary True Stories, 10 Haunting Tales from J J the Japanese Underground. Um, and this is a Dark Sky release. Very cool. These look early too. Yeah, 91. Yeah, cool. So I guess we're going to hop back to the video. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Mm.